Hello, everybody. I'm Benjamin Anthony, co-founder of the Miriam Institute. The Miriam Institute is the premier international forum for Israel-focused dialogue, discussion and debate. And I'm delighted to be here today to record a very far-reaching, wide-ranging interview with Brigadier General retired Moshe Chico Tamir. Now, before I introduce him, I just want to thank JBS for hosting us. And I thank you for your continued following of the good work that they do here. Brigadier General Moshe Chico Tamir is a retired officer of the Israel Defense Forces. He held a series of esteemed command positions within the IDF during the course of his extensive career. Among other achievements, Tamir was tasked by the Israel Defense Forces Senior Command to establish the elite Egoz counter-terror unit which is a fighting force that was created to combat Hezbollah terrorists and their activities in southern Lebanon and northern Israel. The Egoz unit remains one of the IDF's most specialized units to this day, and it is a leader within the special operations community globally. Tamir also served as the commander of the Golani Brigade, a venerated brigade of the Israel Defense Forces that is synonymous with several of Israel's most storied military victories. During the events of the Second Intifada from 2000 to 2005, which saw terrorist activity throughout much of the states of Israel emanating from the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, Tamir was tapped by the then Chief of Staff of the Israel Defense Forces, Lieutenant General Shaul Mofaz, to take the counter-terror activities of the IDF deep into Palestinian strongholds throughout the West Bank. And he is largely recognized as having turned the tide of the Second Intifada from a military perspective to Israel's favor and fortune. He concluded his career as the head of the IDF Southern Command, with a particular focus on the Gaza Strip. And he remains deeply engaged in IDF military planning and took an integral role in the preparation of the ground forces for Operation Guardians of the Wall in 2021. And I'm delighted to have him here with us today. Thank you so very much for being with us, General Tamir. Can I continue to call you Chico? Please do. Great. It's really a pleasure to have you as ever. And you're here in the midst of a lecture tour for the Miriam Institute. We spoke at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy to their graduate students and their doctoral students up at Tufts University in Massachusetts. And you also gave a briefing to faculty members and officers of the United States Military Academy at West Point. And you've also spoken to leaders of the Jewish community and members of the non-Jewish community who are impassioned about the subject of Israel. And today, I get to have an even more wide-ranging interview due to the generosity of JBS. So I thank you for being with us. And I want to begin by asking you to just tell us a little bit about your personal situation. Where do you live in Israel? Where are you, uh, your, your wife, your children, and so on and so forth. But there is something else I want our viewers to be aware of. You're speaking to us today in your individual capacity as a retired general. So it's not on behalf of the Israel Defense Forces or the Israeli government. And I know we'll get a more candid conversation as a result. So tell us about your home and, and family life. Uh, we live in uh, Metula on the board with uh, Lebanon. Uh, my wife, Efrat. Uh, my kids are older. Only the youngest one, Gal, is uh, still serving in uh, uh, it goes. Uh, all my all of my sons uh, served in the Golani Brigade. Most of them in the Goz unit, and um, I've been there since uh, my long service in South Lebanon. This is what brought me to the north of Israel, and since then I fell in love in the with that beautiful uh, area, and stayed there. So let me ask you a question: the the Golani Brigade. So the Golani Brigade really is one of the brigades of the Israel Defense Forces that has legendary, legendary status. What is it about the Golani Brigade that puts it in that position? Uh, well, I can uh, talk for hours about the magic uh, of a unit that consists all the parts of the Israeli society. 
think the Golani Brigade uh, is a extreme example uh, to the merge of uh, Israelis Jews coming from all around the world and uh, the layers of the Israeli society. Uh, there is something bounding uh, in this unit that uh, from the moment you enter it, uh, you become a part, an important part. And I think uh, it doesn't matter what's your background, uh, you are being judged only by uh, your personality and who you are and uh, a special brotherhood uh, and uh, I would say uh, very high values of a fighting force that somehow together merge into uh, a real uh, unique uh, unit. Now, you're also letting me call you Chico for the purpose of this interview and all the other interviews, but on that note, Chico, there's something else that's going on. There's, there's a particular pride there. Where does the pride in the unit come from? Um, I think the pride basically comes uh, from the fact that uh, not being a special forces, not special equipment, uh, not special attitude and care from uh, the high levels of the military, uh, simplicity, and uh, I think uh, a, a huge commitment of the individuals serving in, in, in that unit together create uh, a pride, something it is of course uh, bringing to the results, uh, into the victories, uh, and I think what symbolizes uh, more than anything else, this unit is the commitment. Uh, the brigade went through uh, very hard fighting and we always take pride that uh, first of all we leave no one behind and we uh, always achieve the target no matter what the cost is. And uh, I think these two things, uh, more than anything, symbolizes this, what's special about Golani. So, so tell us now a bit more about your military career. You told us about your family situation, your living situation, but militarily, tell us about the evolution of your service. I joined the military after four years in a military boarding school, so uh, I came prepared. Not prepared for uh, finding myself after a very short period in Beirut in the first uh, Lebanon war. Since then I, um, I served uh, 18 years in South Lebanon in the Golani Brigade from a plain soldier through all the ranks. I uh, commanded the special recon unit, uh, Sayeret Golani. I uh, built up and uh, commanded the Goz unit and I uh, um, I ended my uh, first period in South Lebanon as a brigade commander, territorial brigade commander during the withdrawal from South Lebanon. From there I, um, I received the command for the Golani Brigade during the Second Intifada and uh, uh, led it in, uh, in a long period of uh, hard operations. Uh, in uh, the West Bank and in Gaza. And um, in the middle I was uh, responsible for building the fence between the West Bank and uh, Israel. And from there I went and uh, was responsible, got the uh, command for the Gaza division, uh, prepared and commanded, not from the division, the uh, operation uh, Custard Lead. So that's, that's quite a career. I want to go back to your involvement in Lebanon. We, the Israel Defense Forces, began our presence in southern Lebanon in 1982 under the auspices of then Prime Minister Menachem Begin. And we right. withdrew from southern Lebanon in 2000 under the auspices of then Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Which part of that period were you operating in Lebanon for? The whole, eight, the eight, whole thing. The whole 18 years I served in Lebanon. Uh, but uh, this uh, area, I think, divides into two. 
uh, from 82 until 85, where we were uh, actually during the First Lebanese War, deep inside Lebanon to the lines of Beirut. Uh, but in 85, uh, we established the uh, security zone. And actually, most of, the, of that time, we were fighting along the borders of uh, Israel, um, defending it uh, in, uh, I would say, area between 5 to 15 kilometers from the border. So you were there, you saw all of the evolution of Israel's presence there. Now, at some point, you also mentioned that you were tasked with forming up the Egoz unit. I also mentioned that during the introduction. And as I said, the Egoz unit is really one of the preeminent fighting forces, special operations forces in the world. It's no exaggeration to say that. When you were tasked with that, you were specifically asked to think out of the box, beyond the convention of, of military activities. Why did they need that unit to be formed? And why did they need somebody who was going to change the method of play when it came to tackling Hezbollah at that time? So I think we found ourselves after many years in the security zone, uh, as many other militaries who are deployed in uh, what we call uh, professionally asymmetrical warfare or counter guerrilla warfare, is that they, uh, we have uh, started def uh, being in the defense more and more, uh, closed in the outposts, uh, more cement, more fortification, uh, trying not to lose people. And uh, while you do that, you don't feel it, uh, you lose the initiative. Um, and when you lose the initiative, the enemy takes the uh, initiative to his uh, hands. And I think uh, at the time where the decision uh, uh, by the uh, chief of staff uh, was to change that situation. Now, uh, usually in order to do it, and in the Israeli history we did it uh, a lot of time, you need to take one unit that will lead the way, a small group of people that uh, think in a different way, in a more innovative way, not bound to the rules of engagement, to the rules of how the military operates at that time. Uh, in our past, uh, I think any, uh, many Israelis remember the 101 led by uh, uh, then Major Sharon, mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, led the way for the Israeli military, dictated the values that uh, for a long time remained in the Israeli, um, <coughs> in the Israeli military. And uh, when I was tasked with that, I, I'm, I thought the same. I understood that it's not just uh, building an, a unit with a certain capability, it's a unit that has to lead the way uh, for a new initiative that uh, will think differently, not in a defensive way, will go to the enemy in his outposts where he is moving uh, securely and uh, attack him. And uh, I think in a very short while uh, we succeeded in, uh, in, in achieving that and it goes in its short history in South Lebanon, um, I think moved the battle from uh, the security zone and the areas uh, near the, the Israeli posts to Hezbollah outposts, to their villages, to the area uh, where they were. And uh, it was, uh, I think, a unique experience. Chico, I want to ask you something about the Egoz unit that I haven't turned to you about thus far in our time together. During the opening of the Second Lebanon War, actually before it really was decided to commit ground troops en masse, I was stationed in a series of ambushes along Israel's northern border and the Agoz unit and the Maglan unit was also stationed doing the same thing. And I remember, you'll remember this, there was actually a, a very difficult confrontation between the Agoz soldiers and Hezbollah. It, it wasn't particularly successful. I, I remember them coming back from there and I remember hearing it on the radio and so forth. What went on there? Did, was, was that indicative of perhaps the IDF having 
reduced its readiness or its familiarity, or was it something else? I think uh, in every war, the first battle is uh, something that if you are not completely uh, prepared to, you pay a price, and we were not prepared for it. The Second Lebanese War took uh, the Israeli military by surprise. We uh, were not ready for it. Uh, we were not trained for it. And therefore, a lot of mistakes. Uh, I think uh, the battle that you are describing is uh, just a, a wrong way of deploying a unit. Mm. The unit was put in an situ almost impossible situation, lost five of its uh, combatants, and uh, held uh, a very difficult fight. I'm very proud that they, uh, uh, they paid the price, but they kept the value. They left no one behind. The unit uh, refused to withdraw until uh, it found the last soldier that was uh, the body of the last soldier that was killed. And it took more than almost 24 hours of uh, hard fighting, uh, but uh, at the end they succeeded. Uh, if you look at the whole picture, of, thought, of course, this was not uh, a successful operation. I remember it very clearly because I remember when the guys from Egoz turned up, they're clearly excellent fighters, they're filled with pride, not in a negative sense do I mean that, but in, in, in terms of pride of being chosen to defend the state of Israel against these enemies. And I remember at the end of that battle, when we reconvened back at the base, you could see that they were, if not broken, certainly bowed and, and very, very saddened by, by what they'd had to face there. Tell us about how these men, these young men, some of them you could even say are boys, how tight is the bond in a unit like it goes? First of all, uh, the situation that you are describing, losing friends, uh, in, a, in, in a surprising event like this is uh, hard on any unit. Um, and I think here I must say that uh, immediately after the GOZ unit uh, went back to the fighting and actually for the next uh, almost month led the fighting in Saint Lebanon. So um, from this point of view, I think uh, it is understandable. But the unit is built on the ties between the uh, fighters. Uh, you enlist with your team, and until you, uh, you uh, finish your military service, you are all together. So this is a very special uh, tie that, uh, from the outside, any stranger uh, cannot understand. These are ties that remain for a lifetime. If you will uh, look at uh, not just the GOZ unit, the teams in the special forces, but also in the regular infantry, uh, these people are bound to the rest of their lives. Now you've made mention during your time here with us in the US about the, the fact that war in Israel or the wars that Israel has fought, they're all particularly personal. Tell us, tell us about about some of your recollections that, that demonstrate how personal our conflicts are? Um, I think the fact that uh, all Israel is a military during a war is uh, something unique to Israel. So in many cases you find uh, family members from the same family fighting shoulder to shoulder and uh, I think it's coming to the extreme when it's a uh, father and a son or sons, and in my case, I was uh, commanding uh, the Gaza division, and uh, uh, my son, actually even not the division, I, I was at that time at the uh, South Command, and my, my son was uh, in the pin platoon uh, leading the 12th Battalion of the Golani Brigade, uh, into fighting. Um, I had the time, I took the time, a very short time to see him just before the operation started. And then during the operation that night, the first night of the operation, I was uh, woken 
by my team, um, a little bit alarmed, uh, told me come to the operations center quickly. And we asked what happened, they did not answer. I see that they're looking at each other, so I really went fast. Uh, and when I entered, I understood that one of the uh, planes uh, lost a bomb, and the bomb fell on the 12th battalion, on its uh, on the guard, the front guard of the of the battalion where uh, my son served, and uh, it took uh, I think uh, maybe a few minutes. That for me looked like. Uh, uh, I don't know, a year, until I understood that everyone is okay and it was a big luck because the, actually the bomb fell inside the, between the two lines of soldiers walking. Uh, I think this experience, uh, and I'm, I'm not in a unique position, uh, with me there was another general that his uh, son actually was wounded in that battle. It is something which is uh, very unique to the Israeli uh, military, to the Israeli system, to Israel. Uh, when we are called to the flag, uh, it's uh, everyone. So we've spoken about your personal service there in Sahel and, and the extremely personal nature of that service, which I think is so important for people to hear and to understand, especially those watching in America where the Americans deploy thousands of miles away do what they do and then return to the homeland, those who are fortunate enough to return to the homeland, of course. Now, I want to pull the lens back and I want to start talking about the broader Middle East with Israel still as the focus. So one of the things that you educated the audiences that you've spoken to during your time here was to reevaluate how they look at a map of the Middle East. And there are those who open up a map and they say, well, there are failing states and there are failed states and there are democracies and non-functioning democracies and all sorts of other entities. But you actually say to read the map of the Middle East, you actually need to look at it not along state lines, but along the lines of the different ideologies that are at play and somehow sometimes are in conflict with one another and how Israel fits into that puzzle. T tell us about that. So I think for uh, many years we were uh, adjusted to look at the, uh, at the map because of the threat that Israel confronted uh, as states, the Arab states, against the Israeli nation. And uh, that is easy. You look around Israel, you see Lebanon, you see Syria, you see Egypt, you see Jordan, you see Iraq, and this is also how the Israeli system looked at it. But the uh, development of things uh, in the last, uh, I would say, few decades, has changed completely the picture. The real picture in the Middle East is, is not that. Um, the past of uh, states that are sending their armies to conquer Israel is uh, gone. We, are, uh, we have peace with most of them, and then the other lost the capability to do it. But the real forces that uh, Israel is challenged with today are uh, <laughs> religious, ethnic ideology. And if you look at that map, and you take the cover from the state map, then you will see, uh, I think in the Middle East, two clear lines. One is the Shiite community, uh, the Shiite religious led, unfortunately, by the revolution uh, in, in Iran. And uh, it has like a line in Syria and in Iraq till Lebanon. Uh, in the south till Yemen, and most of the rest of the area is Sunni. So actually, the real map is the uh, tension between these two uh, Muslim parts, or two parts of the Muslim world, some small ethnic groups that are neglected completely in, in, in this, and then Israel. And uh, I think this new map indicates or shows a completely different challenge that Israel has to cope with. Now, um, coping with the ideology, especially extreme fundamental Islam, religious, is something that is very hard for a state that is trying to analyze interests, trying to analyze uh, 
map of power, uh, this behaves completely different. And uh, this is the challenge that, uh, at least for the near future, Israel is uh, standing at. And so let's, let's go back even further. Let's take a, a broader view of some global events, again, with Israel still at the focus of that. There are a lot of people who have criticized Israel's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, saying that it's been insufficient in favor of Ukraine. Among them, President Zelensky himself has done that in multiple forums. There are other people who say Israel's response has been absolutely appropriate and measured, measured correctly. We don't yet know if the viewpoint and perspective will change now that Prime Minister Netanyahu is back in situ. We'll wait and see. But the reason that there's such hesitancy to affix a policy, I think, or to comply with what those who criticize Israel might want, is that you have, you mentioned the, the Shiite forces, and you have Iran seeking to bring into Syria specifically all sorts of contraband that will be used against the states and the citizens of Israel. And there, in Syria, is not only the Syrians, but of course the Russians, who is the invading party against Ukraine. Tell us how important it is for Israel to operate over the skies of Syria and how that impacts our policy with regard to Ukraine. I think the first thing to understand, to answer your question, is to understand how real is the threat from Iran and its proxy organization. I know that there are many people uh, sitting at home and say, okay, they are declaring that they want to wipe Israel off the map. Well, they want to destroy Israel. Um, and it's hard for us to believe that they, are, they really mean what they say. So I think the first thing we need to understand, they mean what they say. For the last few decades, we see Iran implementing its ideology, its strategy, in trying to destroy Israel. They are building the force all around Israel. In Lebanon, we'll talk about Syria, Syria, in Yemen, everywhere, in, in Iraq. And they are trying to build a direct land, on the land, direct way from Iran to Lebanon to the Israeli border. This is a, a, a real danger to the existence of Israel. Now, until we understand how this danger is real, uh, it will be hard for us to understand the Israeli strategy, to understand the Israeli response to everything that happens around it. Um, I think this is a, a, a real threat, and uh, Israel has uh, no Israel has no benefit of trying to avoid it. Israel must confront it. We must realize that this is the threat that we are standing against, and we must operate against it. Now, in this context, Syria is clear. Iran is using Syria as a near base to Israel and as a bridge to Lebanon. Uh, they did it in Iraq, and if you see Iraq, actually, the Shiite <coughs> movement took over large parts of Iraq, they did the same, they are doing the same, and they are trying to do the same thing in uh, Syria. And uh, they are moving directly to Lebanon. Now, if this whole arc will be a Shiite arc controlled by the Iranian, uh, this is an extreme danger to Israel. The Israeli Air Force and the Special Forces are working in Syria almost every night. So, in the context of Syria, Israel does not have the benefit uh, to avoid uh, contradicting the uh, Iranian uh, establishment of its force in, in Syria. And therefore, and since the, uh, the Russians are controlling at least the air, but more in Syria, uh, we have to take it into consideration. We cannot afford just looking at Ukraine and do what our hearts want to do. We need to take here uh, and all the measures that will keep Israel safe. And uh, I think in this context, this is what the government is doing. And you think it's the appropriate policy, basically? It is. Right. I think Israel should do whatever it needs, first of all, for its security. And then uh, it can apply 
any diplomacy or any strategy in other areas, but first of all, Israel security. A quick point about Iran, which you've mentioned several times. During your time in the US, you, you've expressed that if there's one thing you want those who are concerned about Israel to do, it's to make noise, basically, and, and make it clear to people the severi uh, make noise about and make clear to people the severity of the threat coming from Iran towards Israel. Why do you feel so dedicated to that? Why do you want people to, to do that? I think the front that uh, Iran is building, first of all, by Iran and its proxies all around the Middle East, uh, now backed by uh, Syria, uh, by, uh, excuse me, by Russia and by China in a, to a certain way, is something that Israel cannot confront on itself. Um, Israel will do whatever is necessary, I'm sure, to keep uh, its security. But uh, if we will have to do it alone, this will take uh, a price. Uh, the right way, and I think this is uh, why I'm here to talk, and you will hear other Israelis saying, is uh, to build an alliance in the Middle East that will confront the Iranian aggression and the Iranian intentions to destroy Israel. And not just Israel, but to destroy the Middle East as we know it, because the ideology is clear. They want a Shiite state controlled by the uh, religious esteem from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. This is what they are aiming. This is the strategy that they are implementing. And if you look at the map quickly, you will see that they are doing it in the last uh, three decades. For uh, creating such an alliance, we need uh, our biggest ally to lead it. We need the US leadership in the Middle East to uh, gather an alliance with the Gulf states and we had other Sunni states so that uh, it will be clear to the Iranian that uh, going on implementing this strategy will have its cost. And it has to be, there, is, there has to be a line drawn very clearly that uh, when, they, when Iran will cross that line, it will pay the price. Currently, uh, I think I feel so, and many other Israelis, uh, this line is not drawn by the West. And uh, this is giving Iran the opportunity. There is no vacuum. Uh, Iran is taking the advantage of uh, the fact that there is no such a, a, an alliance uh, against it. Another couple of geographical areas I want to speak about, and then we'll turn to some of Israel's internal issues and challenges and opportunities. Let's go back to Lebanon. So if since 2006, the second Lebanon war, the war in which I served, the war about which you've spoken during this interview, since then we've repeatedly been told that there will be another round. When it will be, we don't know. But what we do know is that Lebanon or Hezbollah because they have more than 120,000 rockets and missiles and projectiles that they can launch throughout the states of Israel towards the citizenry and, and also some of the strongholds that Israel has, we might face a barrage of up to 2,200 rockets per day. What might the next round between the IDF and Hezbollah look like? And, and, and also, Tell us about the capabilities of Hezbollah and what makes this such a, a potent terrorist organization. First of all, I think we cannot look at the threat of Hezbollah without connecting it to Iran. If there will be another round in, in Lebanon, it will not be only Lebanon. This will be a round decided by Iran and Hezbollah and probably will uh, use more of the proxy organizations that they are currently operating in the Middle East. So when we are looking at the next war, the, f the first difference that we have to look, it will not be one front. It will be multiple fronts. It could be from Iran 
to Gaza, to Lebanon. Uh, I cannot anticipate what will happen, but I am quite sure it will not stay Lebanon alone. And uh, this is a major consideration. Uh, the second one is that the uh, Hezbollah force buildup in the, since the uh, Second Lebanese War was very extensive. The number of the uh, rockets and the launchers that uh, you are stating, uh, which is covering in distance the whole of Israel, uh, is of course uh, something that uh, can not only change the lives in Israel, uh, it can be uh, disastrous for, uh, for Israel. Therefore, Israel, the answer to that uh, will have to be uh, very, very aggressive. And uh, as much as I know, and I know the plans, this is also what Israel is planning. But we need to consider that this threat is uh, not a regular threat of uh, a terror organization. Hezbollah is an army, 70,000 people, 120 more or less warheads that are aimed 120, at 120,000 mm. warheads aiming at Israel, uh, tunnels that they have been digging for uh, 10 years until uh, Israel uh, made a stop to that. But uh, just think of an organization that is digging tunnel for 10 years just to make an attack and to conquer Israeli settlements along the border. So what we are dealing here with is a very extreme ideologist organization connected to Iran and very sophisticated and well equipped. This is a threat that Israel has to take into consideration very seriously and it does. Let's move over to the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. We are maybe at the beginning of a wave, we might be in the middle of a wave, but we're in the, uh, we are within a wave of violence taking place in that area. Where do you see that going? I don't think that there's anyone with greater experience than you have operating there. I mentioned during the introduction that you turned the tide of during, during the events of Operation Defensive Shield in, in 2002. Tell us where you see things going in, in Judea and Samaria. So when, when we talk about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, first of all, let's uh, take a zoom out and, and look at it. In, in my personal opinion, this is a tragedy of our generation. But uh, the first thing that I, I would say about it, that bottom line, we have not succeeded to reach an, an agreement, and I don't see in the near future, meaning I don't see my generation, not on the Israeli side and not on the Palestinian side, that uh, we are able to achieve uh, a real peace agreement between the two sides. Now, this may uh, sound horrible and it is a tragedy, but for me, I think it's a fact that uh, we need to know how to live with. Uh, too, too much blood has been shed the uh, atrocities between the two sides uh, that have been taken in this generation are too big for us to sit and make peace. Now, um, and also I don't see the leadership, not on the Palestinian side and not on the Israeli side, willing uh, to pay the price, and there will be a price to make such a peace. And if you accept this uh, as a beginning, uh, then I can go further and try to describe what I see, especially on the Palestinian side. The young Palestinian generation today is uh, the most educated in the Middle East. Um, their economy is doing better than uh, many other places around them in the Middle East, but they live uh, very connected to the Israeli uh, economy. And uh, this uh, you know, raises, uh, of course, expectations. And they are not fulfilled. On one side, there is no hope on the political side. On the other side, most of them do not have places to work. And uh, it, 
it creates a huge frustration. And what we see in what you described as a wave that has started maybe a few months ago is really uh, the outcome of this frustration. You see young Palestinians taking weapons and trying to uh, fight Israel, uh, mostly with not real intention of what they want to achieve. It's more, I see it, more as a frustration. Now, this is tragic because it's not a, a real confrontation between the Isra Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, it is more local terror organizations that uh, at the end, uh, Israel uh, can beat them very easily. And, and most of these young people that hold the guns are dead at the end. Just this morning, in, uh, I saw the news in Israel and uh, <clears throat> in uh, Jenin refugee camp, an Israeli special forces unit uh, worked. And during the clashes, while trying to arrest a few terrorists, um, I think four to five Palestinians, armed Palestinians, were killed. So um, the situation is deteriorating. On the other side, um, we are looking at Gaza as an example, and you say, okay, when Israel in Gaza, unlike the uh, West Bank, withdrew from Gaza and is not interfering, not in the management, the daily management of Gaza, and not with the security, unless something comes from Gaza into Israel. Any terror attack that is being launched or uh, any rocket being launched at Israel, then Israel is interfering with it. But as a whole, what we see, we have a Hamastan. It's a... Hamastan. Hamastan. Mm -hmm. It's a country ruled by a, a very religious extremist regime. And uh, I can tell you, being a, a woman in Gaza today is uh, one of the worst places on earth uh, to be so, because it's an extreme regime. And it's a regime, even though it's not a country, they are controlling it. The Americans know it very well from the Taliban. And it's very sim similar. Now, we, we know that if we will leave the control of the West Bank, this is what will happen. If we leave control of, the, of Judea and Samaria, you'll see another Hamastan, but to our eastern flank throughout the West Bank, Correct. basically. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I commanded the Gaza division when it happened. I saw it happening in my, on my own eyes. And I think the assumption should be that the moment the Israel will uh, take the responsibility from the security uh, uh, in the West Bank, this is what will happen. Hamas will take its position and uh, will build a, a, a Hamas administration and a Hamas state also in the West Bank. This is a few kilometers from Tel Aviv. This is uh, less than a few kilometers from other uh, cities and settlements in Israel. And uh, this is something which is, cannot be accepted in, in Israel. And therefore, well, we are in a huge dilemma, and uh, we need to learn how to live with this situation. On one hand, we must remain responsible for the security of Israel through uh, controlling the security in the West Bank. Especially on when the uh, Palestinian Authority leadership uh, is weakened, uh, we see a less effective Palestinian authority, and this is also something that Israel has to take into consideration. As much as we uh, try uh, to enforce them and to, uh, to let them work inside the, uh, their own territories, uh, we come to a, a point that we have uh, no other alternative. When we know that a group of terrorists is uh, planning a suicide bombing attack in Israel, we have no other alternative but to act. And uh, uh, more and more, we have to do it on our own. And uh, I hope that the, uh, at the end, this wave will, uh, will go down a little bit and uh, we can uh, again see the Palestinian Authority taking responsibility for what's happening in the West Bank. But for the time being, it doesn't look so well. Chico, you mentioned that the Palestinian Arabs are among the most educated in the entire Arab, Arab world. But, but there, within that, there is a problem with, with what 
they're being educated towards. For example, and you've spoken about the tragic situation, but for example, they are regularly educated to the notion that the Jewish people are pigs and apes and almost dehumanized uh, the Jewish people in, in the education they receive. Do, do you not think that they bear some responsibility, some agency? It's not just an issue of tragedy, it's also, it's also a, a, an attitude that's being inculcated generation after generation within them by way of what they teach during that educational process. First of all, I would make a distinction between Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, as much uh, as I'm, I'm not uh, content with what's happening in the West Bank, in Gaza, uh, this is the ide ideology. The Muslim Brotherhood, which is Hamas, uh, have a clear ideology. Israel has no right to exist. There should be uh, an Islamic state that will control the whole area, and they are not willing to compromise on anything. And for them, the state of Israel, with all your dis what you described and more than that, of course, the young generation, 75% of the people living in Gaza are under the age of 16. 16. Uh, these young people never really saw Israelis, uh, never saw the Western world. What they know in their life is only what they learn in Gaza and what they see from the media and the internet. But they, they, never, they have never had the chance to really see and live it in their own life. So it's easy to demonize Israel, to demonize Israelis in such a situation. Now, in the West Bank, it's a different situation. They are educated and they are educated on Western education, especially on the higher level. And they are much more open uh, to Israel. They are uh, in, in the, uh, the strings between Israel and the uh, Palestinian Authority from an economic point of view, and especially with Israeli Arabs, which are almost like Israelis in, and, and know Israel very well for the good and for the bad. But there is a connection. And I think there's frustration in, uh, in what we see in the West Bank young people is coming from the fact that they know Israel, they know how, how it, what is uh, Western free life looks like, and what is uh, especially Western economy, and uh, they have what to hope for. And the fact that there is no uh, solution uh, on the political side uh, is bringing this uh, frustration to a peak. I just have a couple more questions, but I want to begin by looking back a little bit. During the Second Intifada, Israelis were being killed in the course of undertaking the perfectly ordinary, being out buying pizza, enjoying a meal, coffee, sitting down for Lela Sedel for the Passover ceremony. And it put, the, I mean, the, the, the destruction that was wrought on is, uh, against Israelis by way of homicide bombings brought Israeli parents, in some cases, to separating their children on a daily basis. So, for example, what I mean by that is they would send their children to school on two separate buses, and they'd bring their children back on two separate buses with the terrible hope that if one child might be taken from them by way of a homicide bombing on a bus, the other child might yet make it home safely. And I believe you were a colonel at that time, and you really pushed, if you want to describe it in different terms, feel free, but I think you really pushed the chief of staff to take the fight to the West Bank, to Judea and Samaria, to turn it around. Why, why were you so determined to really seize the initiative. How did you do that? And how did you feel before you actually managed to grab hold of the reins and to start moving to turn things around? What, what was your feeling as a colonel in the idea for that time? Um, first of all, I think uh, um, in order to answer you, you need, I need a little bit to elaborate about the Israeli military culture. Please, please do. Yeah. It's a different culture, at least from what I experienced in the U.S. military. And I even went to school here and in the Army War College, and, and I follow uh, 
our uh, American colleagues in, in many ways, but there is a difference in, in culture. Israelis are like Israelis. We have chutzpah <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we cross the lines. And of course, everything is personal. And um, therefore, there is an opportunity even for low ranking officers uh, to talk and to say what they think. I believe in it. I believe that uh, this is uh, also what we have to, uh, this is the way that we need to educate our officers. And uh, at least where I was, uh, I think I saw it. Uh, this is one of our biggest strengths. And as an officer in the Israeli military, uh, I saw what's happening inside Israel. Buses blowing up, kids afraid to go to school, uh, people afraid to go to shopping malls. Um, I, uh, I'm, I didn't just feel, I knew this is the responsibility of the Israeli military to stop it and to stop it as fast as it. I was not so interested in the general considerations that the politicians said or the chief of staff. It was not my job. My job as a, a commanding of a, a tough fighting force was uh, to push as much as I can to act and to give my commanders the confidence that it can be done. And I think what um, I knew uh, General Mufaz for uh, many years. And he was then Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Shaul Mufaz. Shaul Mufaz. Mm -hmm. Mufaz is a big warrior. I, I know how he was thinking and uh, this is where I went. When I met him, I told him, um, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that we are not operating. He smiled. But then I told him, look, look at us, all of us, the Golani Brigade, just give us the order and uh, we um, will do anything necessary. At that time, what was necessary is to uh, take over the dense areas, the refugee camps, the Kasbas, where the terrorists uh, found their uh, place to hide from the Israeli military. And uh, we understand there will be a price to that but we believe we can do it. Uh, I did not only feel it, I made all the preparations and in order uh, to achieve this uh, target when I will be ordered to do it. And uh, I think this is what happened. I was not alone. The brigade commanders, Aviv Kochavi, who uh, just uh, left the, uh, uh, as the chief of staff, uh, and Yair Golan, who uh, commanded the Nahal Brigade, we all pushed um, to operate. And I think together we uh, succeeded to uh, push the, uh, the Israeli, uh, not just the chief of staff, but the whole uh, general staff uh, to operate. And uh, luckily also the operation was uh, very successful. Uh, at least the first uh, two to three operations that we took in the West Bank were very successful and it, it gave the confidence, not just uh, to uh, the general staff, but also to the political level that we can do it, we can act and we can stop this terror attack. You've got this amazing triumvirate. You've got Colonel Chico Tamir. You've got, then you have Aviv Kochavi, who became the chief of staff, as you mentioned. Then you've got Yair Golan, who became the deputy Chief of Staff, and all three of you are obviously subordinate to the Chief of Staff, but you've said something very interesting there. You said you had to give the Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Shaul Mofaz, the confidence to go forward. Was he lacking confidence? Is, and, and also, do you think that you could have injected any Chief of Staff with that confidence and they would have then given the go-ahead, or did it need a man like Mofaz to, to give you the green light? First of all, I think as uh, anyone who sent people to war knows how difficult this decision is. Uh, sitting here, it's easy to think uh, he was confident or not confident. I hope that any chief of staff will not be confident before he, he sends me, my sons, or any, uh, any, any soldiers to war anywhere in the world. You need to consider and reconsider. And even if you are quite sure, you are still not confident. You don't know what the outcome will be. You don't know what the cost will be. And this is uh, maybe the hardest decision any military uh, general, any military commander has. And I knew he is in a position that he has to take the most difficult uh, decision uh, at that time. 
and I wanted to, to push him what, to what I thought is right. And I want him, yes, to be more confident uh, that we can do it if he will send us. And um, I'm proud of it. And uh, I think, yes, uh, his personality took uh, part of what I saw. I knew, I knew he was a warrior. I knew that in his heart he understood this is uh, what has to be done. Uh, he had many other considerations. And from my side, I was responsible just for one thing. Uh, to give him the confidence that when he will take the order, we will do it. Now, you also had a direct, because the Prime Minister at the time was Ariel Sharon, a legend of Israel. You also had direct contact with, with Ariel Sharon, or Arik as he's known in, in Israel. What, what was he like? This is a... Uh, 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 I would say uh, a topic of it on its own, how, uh, how he was, but uh, I, will, I will not try to describe him. I only will try to tell you how he affected me. Please. And maybe uh, uh, in one incident to understand the person. And uh, uh, when I commanded the Golani Brigade, the second fight that we took to the Palestinian uh, uh, towns was the town of Tulkarem. After, uh, um, I think, three horrible incidences of uh, suicide bombers going from the refugee camp of Tulkarem to uh, Natania in uh, Israel. They that was when they, they detonated the hotel, right? No, is, before is that. Different? No, okay, it was bef you. before the, uh, the big operation mm -hmm. started, before defensive shield. This is actually the small operations, not so small. These are the operations that we conducted that uh, not just uh, gave uh, the confident by speak, but also by what by we actions. did and by mm. the, uh, uh, <coughs> the achievements. So there was a big achievement because not only did we uh, win this fight, uh, we also made the uh, Palestinian terror force that was in the refugee camp to surrender. And they surrendered their weapons and they surrendered all of them. And uh, in television, of course, this is look, looked like the Israeli military can operate wherever it wants and uh, that the uh, thought of the terrorists that they can hide in the refugee camps uh, is over. And uh, Israel and the IDF can operate uh, wherever it decides to. Um, and it, it was of uh, big importance at that time. So I got a call at the end of that fight and uh, Kaplan was on the phone. He said, someone wants to uh, congratulate you. And Sharon was on the other side of the line. And after he congratulated me for the victory and for the big success and the achievement, and of course told me, uh, please send my regards to your soldiers to your officers, uh, uh, this is a big achievement, and more than that, it's a very important one. Uh, I am sure now every Israeli understands that uh, and the IDF and we are doing everything to defend him. Uh, but then he said on a personal line, he said, can I tell you something very personal? Uh, I said, of course. <laughs> and then he said, uh, you, you do not know what would I give to replace you? <laughs> and, uh, to you take your place there. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Sharon. He remained uh, a soldier to the last uh, day of his life. And uh, of course, and, uh, as a soldier, it uh, made me happy at that time. And, uh, but this is the way that I think this uh, symbolizes the man he was. Anyone on the scene today of Sharon's stature? Anyone? Anyone on the scene in Israel today of the same stature as Ariel Sharon? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not into politics to, uh, to explain that, but I think he was a unique person uh, in what he achieved in his lifetime, and especially in what he built in the Israeli IDF. Uh, Arik Sharon is responsible not just uh, achievements, tactical and operational achievements, but he, uh, he influenced and uh, built the values 
of the Israeli uh, military, and he led the way to uh, many Israeli units of how to operate, and especially on the stu standard of operations. And uh, I think any uh, Israeli military for generations we look up to him, up to him, to uh, and up to his standards, and. Uh, that's it. Chico, before I get to the last couple of points, I do want to make it clear when you use the phrase refugee camps, I think some people think about a couple of tents somewhere. That, that's not what you're describing, right? The refugee camps are densely, what you're calling refugee camps, these are densely built up areas. They're actually towns where the Palestinian Arabs live and they use them as strongholds. And at the times you're speaking of, they use them as strongholds from which to launch horrific, horrific waves of terror against against Israelis, Jewish and non-Jewish, by the yes, way. It's, it's more a refugee quarter, not a, it's not a camp uh, yeah. of uh, tents. Yeah. Uh, these uh, refugee quarters areas have been built uh, in 48 and in 67, and so it's houses, but they are very dense because the uh, areas that uh, they are built on were very small. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about one aspect of current affairs. You've been here in the US with us and one of the things that I've really enjoyed about talking to you in these different venues is hearing your original thought and your original perspective and that's even informed your military career. It's very, very apparent to me. I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with many, many generals. You are among the most, the, the, you are among the, the pinnacle of the original thinkers that I've had the pleasure of working with, and there are a lot of lovers of the State of Israel who are almost despairing in the diaspora, I'm not going to talk about what's going on in Israel, that's, that's a, for a different conversation, about the new composition of Israel's government. And you have a particular perspective that you bring to that analysis. Tell people how they should view, through what lens they should view Israel's current affairs at the level of the government, in your opinion? I don't like people uh, to tell people how to think. <laughs> I'll tell you my opinion. Okay. Uh, but first of all, I think uh, I have to disclose something. Uh, you know, what's, what's happening in Israel, I, I will not uh, talk about the government. The government is a political issue. We went to elections and the government was elected and that's it. <coughs> But what's happening, and the, um, I think the, I wouldn't even call it a struggle, but the, uh, what's happening between the left wing and the right wing, which I don't see it as a left wing as a right, uh, is more a social, um, a social confrontation in Israel between uh, the old elite, who, who their fathers built this state and had the um, uh, opportunity to dictate its value at the beginning of the state and uh, uh, to have control over a lot of, of the systems in, in Israel. And on the other side, there is a very big uh, community of Jews who came from the Arab countries uh, who, uh, you know, we have matured. Our society is, try is starting to mature, and I think this confrontation is, a, is just a symbol to that, uh, is a sign of this maturing, and we have to go through this process. In my mind, we should have gone through this process of maturity maybe decades ago. But it's happening now. Um, the uh, uh, other populations of Israel want, uh, want their place. The influence, the influence of the value on the values of uh, Israel, and, and it cannot be uh, held by a small group, or even not a small group. Um, same with the uh, Orthodox. The, the Orthodox Jews have become a big community in Israel. They are a big percentage of our population. They have their needs. They have their uh, the way that they see their place in the and how they are. Uh, uh, acting as a part in, in, in our society, and there is a lot of disputes around it, and we need to solve it. But uh, I think uh, trying to take it to uh, breaking of the Israeli democracy and trying to call it in only name, this is uh, out of the 
uh, rules here, and it, it's not within it. Uh, it. It's a hard time because going through uh, such a change, a social change, uh, it has a lot of emotions in it. Um, and for me, uh, personally, I told you, I'm on one side, my uh, father came as a young, ch <clears throat> as a young uh, man from uh, Morocco. He was born in Morocco, so I have this side of the family. I can uh, speak Arabic and I can even curse in Morocco. <laughs> on the other side, I'm uh, completely from the Ashkenazi side. My grandfather was one of the biggest supporters of Ben Gurion, uh, uh, and I can even translate you a few phrases in Yiddish. <laughs> so when I look at it on both sides, uh, I, I understand. I understand uh, the point of view of the both sides, um, but I hope that the people who lead the uh, Israeli politics today will be mature enough and responsible enough to calm it down and to have this conversation and to handle this dispute um, with more dignity. But we are Jews, and if there is one thing that Jews know is how to loudly uh, confront each other. We always say 10 uh, Jews in a room, 15 uh, opinions. Uh, this is what's happening in Israel today. And I think also are um, the audience that we are talking to. I know that uh, most of the information that they get is from the Israeli media. Unfortunately, the Israeli media is not so balanced. Uh, if you look at the reporters, their views, most of them can come from the left wing. Most of them belong to the old elite. And so they think that their world is uh, falling apart. It's not falling apart. There are other groups that uh, want to uh, have a say and, uh, for instance, uh, Jewish values. Our Supreme Court, which is the biggest discussion uh, around it, how uh, we think that it took uh, maybe two or three steps more to the liberal side, I understand very little about it, and I'm not involved in this discussion. I only understand it's not a, a real uh, change in our democratic system or in our government. Uh, the root of what you are saying is a sh social dispute that uh, has to be solved by the Israeli people. These elections were a start to that, and uh, probably we will see more of that. And uh, I really hope that the Israeli uh, society will mature from that and that we will grow stronger after this dispute. The dispute everyone will find itself, uh, but uh, as you know, also here in the US, it's a never ending uh, story of uh, communities and people that uh, want uh, to have their say, to have their power, to have their place under the sun. And uh, I think this is a normal and uh, it's also a healthy process. Uh, with all the other things uh, that we are seeing, I mean, there, again, I really hope that uh, it will be handled smartly uh, with the people who is uh, leading it. I'm only going to ask you two very short last questions. You talked about Jewish values. I haven't asked you this till this point. Express for us the importance of being a Jew who served as a Jewish general in a Jewish state. Um, I don't think that I have a, a special point of view, but in, the, in, the, in this case I will uh, I will give you uh, the answer probably my father would, would have given. My father ran, ran away from uh, Morocco as a, when he was 14, after he had a quarrel with a Moroccan policeman. And, uh, um, yeah, he came to Israel, he uh, joined the Golani Brigade, he fought one of the fiercest fights the brigade ever had uh, and after that fight he left the Golani Brigade and went to the uh, uh, Navy SEALs, our Navy SEALs, Shayt et and then he was a Mossad uh, fighter for a long time and he had a very strong view uh, about it. He told me, you, uh, I, uh, I'm so happy that you will never know what it means. Um, to be someone not in your country that uh, cannot 
stand uh, and look in the eyes of the people around you. Wherever you go, you have to look to the floor and uh, be afraid what will happen uh, and never be secure and never feel that where you are walking, it's your street and your home. And he always said, well, the state of Israel has uh, a lot of uh, problems that we have to fix and a lot of things that we have to develop, but it's ours <coughs> and there, uh, there is no other state. And uh, even uh, when uh, uh, members of my family thought to have another uh, passport, he always said, not in over my dead body, <laughs> if uh, uh, you do not understand really what you have in your hand. So, uh, and he was not a big Zionist on his own. He was, uh, uh, he always said, I couldn't found myself in a different place in the world. But uh, this is something I think that uh, my generation understands less because it's obvious. We were born to that situation. Uh, but uh, as uh, always, if you don't know what your past is, you don't know what your, uh, uh, where you come from and where we come from, then probably you will not know where to go. And uh, uh, whenever I need this answer, the uh, answer, the same answer to my children who are serving in the military, and probably we will have to move it forward to the next generation. Israel is the only Jewish state, and uh, it's the only state that we have. Now, ladies and gentlemen at home, Chico, I know that some of you will be fluent in Ivrit, you'll be able to read and to write in Ivrit, and Chico's actually written a book, it's called Milchama Lelo Ot, which means undeclared war, an approximate translation, undeclared war. I'd encourage all of you to go and, and read it, and we're actually potentially going to be looking at translating it into English. My final question, Chico, Milchama Lelo Ot, undeclared war, why did you decide to write this book and, and what is enclosed within its pages? So, I think, first of all, what's enclosed in is the time we uh, fought in Lebanon. From the beginning of the security zone, it's describing 15 years of fighting Hezbollah. And uh, after the withdrawal from South Lebanon, I felt that um, because it was not such a successful war in many uh, terms, the Israeli society and the Israeli political system want to forget it, even the military, they want to forget it. Uh, more than a thousand Israeli soldiers were killed in, in this war. And at that time, there was uh, even not a sign for, uh, for the war, and I felt that it will be forgotten. I really, uh, I was afraid it will be forgotten. I, I, I was afraid that uh, the people who fought it, and especially the people who did not uh, come back from that fight will be forgotten. And I thought the best way to do it uh, is to write the story through my eyes. And this is really um, the story of the fighting in uh, South Lebanon through my eyes and through the eyes of the uh, field commanders and the soldiers. Uh, who took part in that war. Well, I'm very pleased that you did put pen to paper and I'm very pleased that people have the opportunity to learn more about that. And thank you so very much for such an incredible interview. I continue to learn from you, very much appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, they, there you have it, an interview with a legendary commander of the Israel Defense Forces. There are sometimes strategic heroes, there are other times battlefield heroes. Brigadier General Moshe Chico Tamir is that rare combination of both. We've had a high privilege here at the Miriam Institute in terms of being able to bring him to live audiences here in the United States of America. We consider it a high privilege to be able to bring his words to you at home. And we thank all of you here for your ongoing support and connection with the vital work undertaken at JBS. And I'd like to say on behalf of the Miriam Institute, we thank JBS and their entire talented team here. And I look forward to next time. Thank you for listening to this interview with Brigadier General Moshe Chico Tamir. Thanks, Chico. That's great. Thank you.